Coming up now on Animal Outtakes. They're engineers. They're, <laughs> I mean, people from all over the world want to know how they dig a perfect little hole. This is one of the smallest species of owls, and he's pretty unique. You won't believe where these little guys call home. We've been able to teach him and, and watch him grow to become the kid that didn't know anything about a horse to sitting in the boardroom once a month and giving a voice to our younger group. A young man is learning some important skills all by volunteering his time. They're quiet. You don't have to get rabies vaccines. They're an okay apartment pet, right? You don't have to take them for walks. You can have them in an apartment in New York City and enjoy them just as much. And it sounds like a perfect pet. But is a snake right for you? This and much more straight ahead on Animal Outtakes. Hello and welcome to Animal Outtakes. I'm Marcia Panucci, and this is my trusted co-host, Zeus. If I was to ask you where an owl lives, most people would likely think in a tree. But there is a species of owl who you won't find making its home high up in tree branches. Instead, they are digging holes in the ground. <laughs> Next to a busy and noisy road in Cape Coral, Florida, full of construction equipment and people. This certainly is not a place you would expect to find the largest population of the burrowing owl in the state. And you won't be looking up to see this species. You need to look down. Why is Cape Coral appearing to be the capital? for burrowing owls. We are the capital and we're very proud of that. And the reason for that is when Cape Coral was developed, um, they cleared all the land before the EPA existed. And so they dug 400 miles of canals, they put sand everywhere, and that is natural habitat for the owls. So it's easy digging. And so the owls that were around maybe in Fort Myers or in cow pastures, they said, oh, let's go to Cape Coral, easy digging. And that's how we ended up with such a great population of burrowing owls. Now, as we walked over to his little burrow, that head was following us, obviously the eyes, which must be very keen. But that neck was moving around and around. Is that usual for them? Yeah, owls can turn their head because they don't have the eye muscles that humans have. So it's not like I can look to the side or look to the left. So they literally have to turn their head to see you. Um, because they don't have those eye muscles that we have. So they can turn their head almost upside down all the way to uh, halfway around to look at you. And that's, that's the reason they, they get into these funny little poses. Now we are so used to uh, animals in the wild shying away from us, being scared. Uh, we rarely in the wild are able to get up so close to this uh, type of animal. Why is he letting us come so close? Owls are, um, I won't say social in nature, but when they get used to people, they let you approach them. And this particular burrow, there's always people walking by, so they get used to that movement. You know, there's dogs walking by, there's people walking by, so they know that they're not threatened. But other owls that live out further in nature, if you were to approach them because they're not used to people and they see you as a threat, they're very skittish and they would not have the same reaction. So like anything else, owls have personalities just like people. Some are friendlier, some are not. Well, I would say he's very trusting of us. He is isn't very he? trusting of us. Very, very trusting. Now, is this how he spends his day, uh, kind of peering out on his porch of the burrow? And, uh, what does he do? At, the, at this point in time, because it probably is hot for him, so when it's hot, they stay in the burrows where it's much cooler. Also, we are in a drought, so the grass is very low and there's no protection for him. But typically, they'll come out to hunt early uh, dusk and dawn, you know, just at the sunrise and sun setting. When the bugs start to come out, that's when they come and do their hunting or during the nighttime. And so during the daytime, they're also resting because they've been hunting all night. Now these burrows, I mean, we're looking at the uh, threshold here of the burrow, 
But it looks very deep and long, is it? It is very deep and long, and, and the longer they stay in the burrow, the deeper that burrow, I wouldn't say deeper, the longer it gets. Those burrows can go 10 feet long. So it's not just a hole in the ground, they actually burrow tunnels. And they're doing that all by themselves? All by themselves with their two little legs. They're like little engineers and they make it perfectly round. They make it just the right size so predators can't get in and out. There's only one, one hole in, one hole out. They don't want a second hole because otherwise predators can come and get in there. They're, they're so cute and harmless and they do so good for the community and for wildlife and for keeping our insect population down, our rat population down. They're the exterminators you don't have to pay. Why are we concerned about the burrowing owl? So many other things in this world to be concerned about. But you're concerned about this darling creature that we're looking at here. Why? You just said it, they're darling. <laughs> but we are concerned because it is part of the chain of life. And so if you see one species disappear, you see the next species and the next species, and you're seeing it across the world. So somewhere we need to take action to preserve. I hope that my grandchildren will be able to stand here and see a burrowing owl in the wild as opposed to having to go to a zoo to see one. And that's what it's all about is education and preservation, conservation, living together with nature. Nature was here. First. First. The burrowing owl is a federally protected species. Even disturbing their burrow is illegal and can result in a heavy fine. Cape Coral Friends of Wildlife is dedicated to raising awareness and protecting the burrowing owl. As the community of Cape Coral grows, the group encourages residents to start their own burrows in their own yards in the hopes of attracting the owls. They have lots of information on their website and if you're in the area of Cape Coral, the 15th annual Burrowing Owl Festival will be taking place February 25th. Our next story is about a therapeutic horseback riding program that helps individuals with disabilities. The program thrives on the support of volunteers. And it is one young volunteer who says the horses are the teachers, and he has learned some important life skills along the way. I enjoy, you know, all the time I've spent out here, you know, quite a few service hours and basically just, I've always had a good time out here. 18 year old Bernie Chakowski doesn't ride horses. In fact, when he first visited SMART, the Sarasota Manatee Association for Riding Therapy, Bernie had no equine experience at all. I came out to SMART one day and I didn't see it on the first day, but the second or third time I came back, it just clicked. I mean. I felt like I belonged here. The you know, volunteers are a great community, and we all just work together really well. And I love the mission, and it worked out for me. We provide equine therapy to people with disabilities, and that ranges from everyone from age five to however old you can make it out here. And it's you know we work with a whole bunch of different people, and we try to be accommodating to everyone. And so far. You know, I've always seen people leave with a happy face, and that's my favorite part. SMART helps individuals with disabilities through horse-related therapeutic programs. And it is volunteers like Bernie that keep SMART operating, running six days a week. Basically, I do everything from cleaning up after the horses to fixing something that might have broken down or needs a little help, um, just care of the facility, any kind of maintenance or landscaping. Uh, we work with the board. I mean, if you name it, we've pretty much done it. Bernie wanted to get even more involved. He and his friend decided to start the Youth Advisory Board for SMART, where younger volunteers can give input on the programs, offering a younger generation's perspective. Bernie, I believe, came in when he was 14, uh, which is our the youngest minimum age that you have to be to be a volunteer for our program. And so he's grown up here and we've got to see him mature and we've been able to teach him empathy. We've been able to teach him compassion. Um, we've been able to teach him and, and watch him grow to become the kid that didn't know anything about a horse to sitting in the boardroom once a month and giving a voice to our younger group. I just feel happy here. Um, basically, 
you for, once you come in through the gate, you forget everything. It's all about the moment. It's all about the lesson. Kind of, you know, it's about the rider. And that's, I think the same happens for them because they come in the gate and they forget about the disability. They forget about the struggles that they might have at home. And they can just, you know, have a good time on a horse and relax. And they don't know it, but they are really getting better. And it just seems like fun. What a terrific young man. This just goes to show getting involved in volunteering with animal organizations not only helps the animals, but you can receive much more than the satisfaction of giving your time. You can also learn many important life lessons along the way. This reptile is native to South America and the Caribbean. But why can you find green iguanas here in the United States? We'll learn more about this lizard next. Stay with us. For thousands of years, we've been human's best friend. You've been through a lot, and we've been right there with you. A dog is part of the family, a confidant, and a friend who always knows how to get into your heart. So what happens to our beloved companions when we can no longer care for them? This is why we've created Dante's Den, an innovative, state-of-the-art facility that will provide care for up to 100 dogs. Dante's Den is a community for joyful dogs. Millions of Americans face uncertainty when planning for the future of beloved pets who may well outlive them. Dante's Den is a charitable organization, so in whatever capacity you can, please lend your support so that we may continue this most wonderful work. Dante and I would like to thank you for watching and for also opening up your hearts to our wonderful community of joyful dogs. Learn about the many ways you can become involved by visiting dantesden.org. The crested caracara is listed in Florida as threatened. Their numbers have declined due to many factors, including illegal hunting. Help support efforts to eliminate the threat of illegal hunting, not just for birds of prey, such as the caracara, but for all wildlife. Always alert authorities if you see people hunting illegally, or if you see wildlife parts, such as feathers, being sold illegally. Welcome back. Travel down to the Florida Keys and you'll definitely spot a green iguana. It's the largest lizard found in America. But it's not an animal that you should find here. It is considered an invasive species. We talk about invasive species. Right. We have quite a few of them in Florida, don't we? We do, we have a lot. We actually, in Florida is the, uh, the highest condensed level of invasive species that we have. And this lizard, a green iguana, is one of them. It is believed originally they were stowaways on board ships that came to the Florida Keys. But the population in southern Florida has grown. More and more were introduced into the wild through the pet trade. You know, it depends on who you talk to. I think a lot of it has to do with the pet trade. Uh, people a long time ago were releasing a lot of animals back into the wild because in their mind, hey, I bought this, it's a lizard, it'll do okay out there. Not understanding what it can do to other things. Adult green iguanas can grow more than six feet long and half of the length of this big herbivore is its tail. <laughs> they like to have them up real nice and tall, and they look really, really strong and, and, and dominant. That's a, this is a showboat for a male. They get real big on the males, and so does the dewlap. This is called a dewlap, and the males get very, very large dewlap. And the marbles on each side of the jaw here get really, really predominant on the males as adults up to about that big. So the size of a softball or a baseball. So that's when they're courting. Right, that's when they're courting. Now, when they're little like this, they really don't have much defense. So they either jump in the water, or they'll detach their tail and their tail will flop around on the ground. Let's get this straight. He can drop this part of the tail? All the way up to the All the way up to all here. All the way to about here. Okay. And, and drop it 
and it will flop around on the ground for a few minutes and then the predator will go after that. And when the predator goes after that, he has a chance to get away. I see. So they generally they just rejuve and they'll, it'll grow a new tail. Most lizards do But that. how does it release that tail? Is he chomping it? Is he turning around nope. to he'll, cut it? No, he'll, he'll move and the muscles release and it'll just drop off on its own. They actually have apparatuses in here that can release that stuff. It can be pulled off. So if like an animal grabs it too and yanks it to take him to eat him, a bird say, it'll pull and it'll just detach. And it's just a fine uh, um, cartilage in there, and it just grows right back. And now it goes. doesn't hurt him, though. You know, I think pain is a, is a, is a receptor. <laughs> I think he feels it, but I think like us, when adrenaline's heavy, I don't think it's as painful to lose this tail as it would be a ligament, an arm, of a leg, course, of course. a piece of his face, or eyesight, something like that. That he wouldn't be able to survive. Right. They'd evolve to lose this, so I would assume. I don't know him personally, and I apologize if I'm lying. That I would assume that the nerve endings wouldn't be as bad of a loss for him, as opposed to the rest of his body. And that long tail is not only used as a defense mechanism, but also as a propeller. Green iguanas are excellent swimmers, preferring to live near the water. And they can hold their breath for about 30 minutes. And not all green iguanas live up to their name. They come in many different colors. Once again... Troy, nature at its best. Yes. We're not, we're looking at blended greens here. Yep. Uh, we have little speckled dots within the black spots. I mean, it's just amazing, the coloring. And it's so wonderful to be able to get up close and personal with these animals and really not be afraid at this point. Green iguanas are a popular pet for the right owners. Iguanas can grow quickly and need a habitat that will give them lots of room. For those who have one as a pet and no longer can take care of them, it is best to surrender them over to your local humane society. But you should never let them go into the wild. Coming up next on Pet of the Week, this might be the perfect animal for you if you have allergies or you just don't want a pet that you would have to take for a walk. Dr. Don shows us a slithery friend next. about my mother and I'm here and I just want to thank you because it saved my mother's life yesterday um, and I'd like to know the names of the people that came in and saved her so I could call and thank them and she's doing fine it's a wonderful thing thank you when you fall and cannot get up an accident can turn into a tragedy but with life alert one touch of a button can get you help fast Life Alert saves a person from a catastrophe every 10 minutes. Life Alert is a lifesaver. If it weren't for Life Alert, I wouldn't be sitting here today. For a free Life Alert brochure, call 1-800-652-3012. That's 1-800-652-3012. Call now, 1-800-652-3012. For a free brochure, call 1-800-652-3012. Thanks for staying with us. The ball python gets its name because of the shape it takes if the snake feels threatened, it curls up into a ball. And while a snake may not be the traditional family pet for most people, we found out how docile and unique a pet snake can be. Dr. Don, here we are with, of all things, a snake. <laughs> well, it's a ball python. Okay. It's about the nicest, slowest moving of all the snakes. It's a small constrictor. The biggest one I think I've ever seen is only about four foot long. They're not a pet for everybody. If you're immunosuppressed, shouldn't have it. An elegant study done by the Chicago Herpetological Society about 28 years ago saying that two thirds of all healthy, beautiful, good looking snakes, if you culture them, two thirds are shedding salmonella at any one time. Thousand different kinds of salmonella, ranging from not bad at all to kill you dead. It depends on your immune system too. 
about one-third of healthy lizards, and about 5% of healthy turtles are shedding salmonella at any one time. And turtles got the bad rap. In many states, you can't buy a turtle, period. And when it comes to snakes, it's just I say, when you're, you touch them, wash your hands when you're done. Don't be eating a sandwich and playing with your snake. Don't let your snake on the cutting board in your kitchen while you're chopping your fruits and vegetables and stuff up. A snake is, should be kept in a uh, escape-proof cage. They need to be kept warm, but not too hot. And it's best to buy them that are already eating and know how to eat frozen and thawed mice and th frozen and thawed rats. You'll never see a snake being chewed up by a rat. And I've seen every snake you can think of with bite wounds and some killed by rats, mice, hamsters, you name it. If they're a little bit too cold, they're slow. And that warm-blooded mouse or rat can just chew the heck out of them and kill them. Now the danger of having a snake like this would be? The danger of a snake like this is purely you know, salmonella. Or that's about it. That's it. When it comes to having large constrictors as pets, some states like Florida don't allow them. They may be cute when they're little. You know, you get a Burmese python, oh, look how cute it is. If you take care of a Burmese python well, in three years, they're too big. And what are you going to do when your snake gets too big? Everybody says, I'll give them to a zoo. They don't want your snake. <laughs> they don't want them. You can't let them go. So if you want to look for a, if you want to have a snake as a pet, first, if you're a parent, you know that you are the one responsible for the animal, not your kid. Kids aren't responsible. The most important thing I'll say, and I'll repeat for every animal, is do your research before you get one. Find out, can you take care of it? What do they eat? How big of a cage they need? Do they need the right light? You know, the ultraviolet light. Do they need warmth? What kind of food? Can you take care of it? And how long do they live? How long does this ball python yes. live? Good question. How long does a ball, th ball python qu live? The answer to any question is, it depends. And if you take care of them right, no one knows. There was one at the Philadelphia Zoo that was brought in as an adult, and they had it for 45 years before it died. So if you take care of them right, it's going to be a generational pet. Now, what type of illnesses would a snake like this have? Just about anything you can think of I've seen with snakes. Not only just trauma, but if they're, their whole immune system is dependent on warmth their temperature and their humidity. I've never seen a sick reptile that did not have an underlying husbandry problem. They can have mites, they can have all sorts of stuff, they can have ticks, and you just look at the bottom of their, their throat like that, see how it folds up? Great place to look for mites. They're about the size of a grain of pepper. So would you recommend a snake like this as a family pet? Only if it is worthwhile to have them and willing to put in the effort to keep them alive you certainly wouldn't give it to somebody that's a terrified of reptiles. You wouldn't give it to somebody that is immunocompromised on chemotherapy or what have you not. Other than that, they're quiet. You don't have to get rabies vaccines. They're an okay apartment pet, right? You don't have to take them for walks. You can have them in an apartment in New York City and enjoy them just as much. And there are kids out there that are allergic to fin, everything with feathers. They're allergic to everything in the world. You can now have a pet and it's hypoallergenic. Just remember when you're done, you wash your hands, right? Right. And of course, Dr. Don stresses, do your research before you purchase any pet. And speaking of pets, after the break, we'll show you a fun competition that highlights some unique doggy talents. And it's all for a good cause. Attention blood clot filter patients. Surgically implanted blood clot filters are potentially life-threatening. Some filters are prone to breaking, resulting in pieces of the filter moving through the body and causing internal bleeding. If you had surgery to implant a blood clot filter, you may be entitled to a cash award, even if you haven't suffered side effects yet. Call the Gold Shield Group now, 888-747-5291, to see if you qualify for a cash award, 888-747-5291. I'm calling in regards about my mother, and I'm here, and I just want to thank you because it saved my mother's life yesterday. And I'd like to know the names of the people that came in and saved her. It's a wonderful thing. Thank you. With Life Alert, one touch of a button can get you help fast. For a free Life Alert brochure, call 1-800-962-4112. That's 1-800-962-4112. Call now, 1-800-962-4112. I'm calling in regards about my mother, and I'm here, and I just want to thank you because it saved my mother's life yesterday. Um, 
and I'd like to know the names of the people that came in and saved her so I could call and thank them. And she's doing fine. It's a wonderful thing. Thank you. When you fall and cannot get up, an accident can turn into a tragedy. But with Life Alert, one touch of a button can get you help fast. Life Alert saves a person from a catastrophe every 10 minutes. Life Alert is a lifesaver. If it weren't for Life Alert, I wouldn't be sitting here today. For a free Life Alert brochure, call 1-800-652-3012. That's 1-800-652-3012. Call now, 1-800-652-3012. For a free brochure, call 1-800-652-3012. Welcome back to Animal Outtakes. Recently, Dante's Den held its annual fundraiser, Top Dog. This entertaining spoof on traditional dog shows helps to give supporters a look at what's new with the organization while taking part in a fun and friendly competition. Let's take a look. The theme for the 2017 Top Dog fundraiser benefiting Dante's Den was Carnivale di Cani, the Carnival of Dogs an Italian-themed evening of fun for humans and their furry friends. More than 175 guests poured into the hall, which was decked out in checkered tablecloths and sunflowers, perfect for an Italian feast. Dogs of all shapes and sizes, big and small, were on hand to share the evening with their humans and to learn about Dante's Den. The facility, on 50 acres in Mayaca City, has been open for over a year and a half and has serviced over 200 dogs in that time in all of their programs. The Semper Paw program continues to grow, offering soldiers deploying overseas a safe and secure place to keep their dogs while they are serving our country. And the need for additional space is eminent, following the explosion of interest in the lifetime care and pet trust programs. But the opportunity for canine glory had many attendees ready to roll, especially the four-legged ones. The dogs competed in four categories. Best hair, best singer, best kiss, and best dressed. After the ribbons were awarded, it was time to name this year's top dog. By a crowd vote, the winner of the 27th is Bo black lab who won the best dress category. Bo will represent Dante's Den for the upcoming year and of course has the bragging rights that come along with it. That sure was a great event, wasn't it Zeus? We hope you've had fun and learned a thing or two along the way. Zeus and I will be back here again next week with even more animals and some wild adventures. Until then, thanks for watching. Once upon a time, there were children who didn't know the magic of books. They didn't have stories to introduce them to enchanting characters. Now you can give stories that change lives. Go to magicofstorytelling.com to give all children the chance to follow their dreams. Check out My Suncoast Dining on mysuncoast.com for Chef Judy's favorite recipes, restaurant guide, and more. Go to mysuncoast.com slash dining. Are you paying too much for your cable or satellite TV? The U.S. government passed a bill mandating free over-the-air digital transmission of all broadcast network television channels. That means with the new TV Freeway digital antenna, you can get free HD programming from your favorite broadcast networks 24-7 without a bill. You just plug it into the back of your TV and start watching all of your favorite broadcast programs for free. There are no contracts to sign, no hidden fees, and no monthly fees. Just free HD broadcast TV. Take it with you anywhere. Call or go online now to get your TV freeway stick for the incredibly low price of only $14.99. But wait, call or click now and you can get a second TV freeway stick for a second TV. Just pay a separate fee. But you have to order right now. 
Call 1-800-809-5196 to get your TV freeway. Call now or go to tvfreeway.com. So call 1-800-809-5196. This offer's not in any store. Call now. ABC 7 News at 7, weeknights. 